Good evening. It's a, a tremendous uh, pleasure to be in Mumbai. Uh, the University of Edinburgh <coughs> has lots of uh, links with India, lots, <coughs> lots of historical uh, connections. Uh, one of my predecessors, uh, William Robertson, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, who established the, what we think of as the modern style of writing his, history books. Uh, he wrote for the, the Western audience um, in 1789, the first history of India um, that was accessible uh, in Europe. Currently, the University of Edinburgh has um, 350 students from India. We have a lot of partnerships, and we have an office in Mumbai, headed by my wonderful colleague, Amrita. Wave your hand, so if you... Uh, and I also have my wonderful co colleague Liz. So if, you are, if afterwards you want to ask questions about the University of Edinburgh and its connections uh, to India, do feel free uh, to approach them. Um, so that's a little bit about the University of Edinburgh's connections to India, which are going stronger. Um, in terms of my own background, um, to my horror um, looking up at the, that date there, I started doing work on applying computers to support learning a, about 50 years ago. Um, it's, this is my core area. That's uh, my academic discipline. I got a doctorate in uh, m machine learning. And then I was an academic uh, working as an academic in California and in the Open University on machine learning. And then I moved to the dark side and became a university manager. And then for the last 20 years, um, I was a pro vice chancellor at the Open University, and then I moved to head Birkbeck College in London and be pro vice chancellor of the University of London, and then for 15 years. Um, so, and so, but having moved to the dark side uh, and being one of these awful managers, I then noticed uh, on my annual leave, research leave in California uh, in 2012 something uh, really exciting which was an area which I'm very familiar with, which has been in a way quite stable, and I'll tell you about that. Um, in 2012, it started changing quite quickly uh, with the MOOCs. So I'll tell you a little bit about that and a little bit about where I think things are going. So in this talk, I'll talk about online learning at, in, in Edinburgh and the university. I'll talk a bit about citizen science. I mean, so one of the reasons I'm a real enthusiast for e-learning is it's a way of democratizing access to knowledge, in particular uh, science, which can have quite high barriers, has been democratized. I'll talk about the ecology of e-learning, and the simple question I was interested in, and I've been giving talks about, and I went to to the, the Google HQ and all sorts of places to talk about this. Simple question I've been interested in with, is with the MOOCs developing so quickly, uh, were they killing anything? Were, was some other part of the educational system, the conventional system or online, uh, how was that changing? I'll talk a little bit about data science, a little bit about uh, learning analytics and one of the things that has happened is as we've suddenly moved in online learning from online learning from courses that might have had 500, 1,000 people, so sort of, sort of big, but not that big really. When you move from courses like that to courses that have 100,000 people, all of a sudden you can do statistics. And learning analytics is all about taking advantage as we also do in health, with health data, of the fact that once you have 100,000 data points, you can start saying with confidence, a student who makes this mistake, if we do not correct it, will make that mistake. Or a patient who shows this symptom, if we do not give them this prophylactic, will develop that symptom. So analytics, very important. And if you are on the dark side and you, you run an institution, um, you have to be optimistic. It's the only, only way you can do your job. Uh, so I will obviously finish uh, with an optimistic conclusion. Uh, but, but it's actually a sincere uh, optimistic conclusion. If you look at the University of Edinburgh, we're a, a we have a regular student body of about 38,000 um, physically located in Edinburgh. And when we talk about e-learning at Edinburgh, we, talk about, we, we, we are talking about students are on campus, those 38,000 students, two-thirds are undergraduates, one-third postgraduate. Nowadays, there is no conventional course that the University of Edinburgh offers that does not have online aspects. 
All courses involve submitting assessment electronically. Courses will involve using a simulation or a database. There may be tools. Um, students do quite interesting things. They start a chemistry, a complicated chemistry experiment going in the laboratory. Uh, they attach the experiment to a computer. They go to their hall of residence, they have their tea, and then they log in remotely from the hall of residence, or they may even do it while they're having their, their, their supper, to see how the experiment is doing and what the data is. So online, on campus, we call that e-learning. For us, we have been going quite strong on online and matriculated master's courses. We now have 80 online master's courses. Probably the most surprising online master's course we have is we have an online distance master's course in advanced surgery. Advanced surgery. Um, so is, is anybody in the room a surgeon? Any surgeons in the room? None of you are allowed to take this course. Uh, because in order to take the, uh, the course, you have to be a surgeon, qualified, and you have to be in a hospital that lets you do surgery. And you have to be willing to come to Edinburgh for a couple of weeks because the online master's in advanced surgery is a partnership with the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. And with something like surgery, we would really like to meet you. Before we let you use that laser, we'd like to meet you and just check that you are who you say you are. So you have to come to Edinburgh for a couple of weeks, and the surgeons who do that enjoy, enjoy that. Um, and one of the th interesting things about advanced surgery is wh what do you think a surgeon does nowadays? Do you think a surgeon takes a knife and goes like that? No. What a surgeon does um, a lot of the time is they sit at a keyboard and they type and they use a mouse and they're looking at an image of a part of the patient and there is a scanning device and there is something like a laser. So that means in actually on online teaching of surgery is quite easy because a virtual patient does not look very different from a real patient. They both a virtual patient and a real patient that appear on the screen and you look at their lung or their liver or their kidney and you make an incision. The difference is, of course, um, you can kill the virtual patient repeatedly and that's fine. You could even experimentally say, let's cut a big piece off the liver and see if the virtual patient survives. You shouldn't really do this with that with a human patient. So, so that's, but we have a range. The thing that is sort of interesting about our 80 online masters is they're particularly congregated in the professional schools, um, in medicine, in veterinary medicine, in law, in education. Uh, but they are, they are spreading. And for somebody running a university, an online masters is a nice thing because the student uh, does not need a visa. The student does not need accommodation. And if there is a currency exchange fluctuation, it doesn't matter because the student is paying for their course in their local currency. Uh, so they don't come to the UK and say, oh my gosh, the rupees are worth much less. Um, uh, or nowadays would probably say the rupee is worth more. Uh, <laughs> but historically, there was a risk in, in coming to Britain. Uh, so, there, so there is a... a and what one sees with these online masters is typically they are hybrid. That is, typically there will be some face-to-face, -face, maybe not a lot. And then last, we see the big new thing, online free access to MOOCs, the massive open online courses built on OERs, uh, open educational resources. Now, the technology underlying the MOOCs is not that new. Uh, MIT, 15 years ago, was making available all its electronic uh, open, edu uh, open education resources. They have been around in a different form. What was new was that in 2012, some people at uh, Stanford, particularly Sebastian Th uh, Thrum and uh, Daphne Collar, they started taking open, educa open educational resources and attaching some structure, some electronic support, some way of going. And I was in, at Stanford in March 2012. Uh, when Sebastian Thrum was the first person in the world to have an online course that reached an audience of more than 100,000. In fact, he reached an audience of 160,000. And at that point, that sort of became interesting. It became interesting for us at Edinburgh 
Uh, so we have um, got uh, a range of online master of, of MOOCs with reaching much larger numbers, but they are, and they are for free. Um, for one of the our most successful one, which for a while was the most successful MOOC in the world, it reached about a third of a million, uh, was an introduction to philosophy. And uh, a bit unusual for a MOOC because m many of the uh, students were actually school age and, what, and one of the drivers there was lots of students asking themselves the question, what is philosophy at a university like? Um, so we did that. We had at Edinburgh the course that has had the best retention and completion of any uh, MOOC. MOOC on equine nutrition, on what do you feed a horse. Uh, we, for, for a lot of people, oats and barley part three might be boring, but if you actually are a horse owner, you are quite serious about this, so you take the whole course. And the thing to know is we have a free MOOC on equine nutrition, and people like that very much. And then we have an online master's, which is it's a premium course, which is not at all free, it's quite expensive, on, which t and it takes two years on equine health. And clearly you need a, access to horses to do that too. And that, and that then is a nice route. So there's a whole different pattern uh, of, uh, of MOOCs. Um, and maybe in the discussion, I, I will give you some other examples. Here is um, recent University of Edinburgh MOOC data. Um, it's really very fresh. It's um, for this month. So in terms of people who signed up and started doing it, we had 2.2 million. Um, a figure we can, that is interesting to pick out is we've had about half a million forum posts from these. Uh, we have had 114,000 completion certificates. So this is a big community. You, at Edinburgh, people come to us from 160 countries in the world. When the MOOCs, we reach 201 countries. The only country of any size we don't reach or don't seem to reach is North Korea. Uh, we also don't reach the Vatican City. Very few people seem to live in the Vatican City. And then there are five islands, each of which I think is about the size of this room. Uh, but we've basically got uh, worldwide coverage. Um, in terms of our 2.2 million learners, 7% of them are, in, are coming from India, which is, which is quite a big number, I think, 7%. The, 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 the largest number, of course, comes from the United States, where culturally the, you know, the MOOC is very familiar. Um, uh, but so the, these are big numbers. Uh, and these 40 MOOCs are supported by seven core staff. Uh, we work on different MOOC platforms. We work on one called Coursera, uh, one called edX, one called FutureLearn. Google has a, a platform called Course Builder. Uh, we use that too. And we've had about 120 professors been involved in creation. They, they enjoy doing this. And we've had 118 teaching assistants. And so typically what happens in a MOOC is the students are organized in electronic groups of about 25. They have debates about what questions they want to ask. And then if, if they're stuck on something, they ask a question. The teaching assistants provide answers, but these answers straight away go, are turned into what are called FAQs, frequently asked questions. So when you ask the question, how can that relatively small number of teaching assistants uh, operate this large number of learners, mostly it is the learners helping each other. So for example, on our equine nutrition MOOC, we had the person who's in charge of horses in the British Army, and who, he obviously was explaining when the other students were stuck about horses to them. So you have often very skillful people. So there's a lot of peer learning going on, a very large amount, but when they are stuck, then the teaching assistants produce answers, but those answers then are easily available for other groups that become stuck. So that is quite good data, quite enjoyable. Um, the staff who do this uh, like it. Um, the philosophy MOOC, I originally, we have some very famous philosophers at Edinburgh. I wanted a famous philosopher uh, to do the MOOC. Um, I don't know if any of you are used to academic management, but you can't really manage professors and the professors you can manage least are the philosophers. Because if you ask them to do anything, they say, why? 
<laughs> uh, so the philosophers wouldn't do what I wanted them to. What they instead did was they got seven unknown young philosophers to do their MOOC. And these were very attractive young philosophers, really very hairy, with big, big woolly jumpers and big jewelry and sandals and things, and looked like philosophers. And they, were, they became very excited because when they were, you know, we have a third of a million people, they would go into a supermarket and people would recognize them and, and ask them a question about knowing and nothingness or whatever. And, and I said to these young philosophers, uh, have you thought about doing a book? And they said, what do you mean a book? We are unknown young philosophers. I said, you just tell some publishers that there are a third of a million people whose email addresses you've got who think you're wonderful. And, and they came back the following week and said, oh, we're principal, everybody wants to publish our book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they published a book. It was very successful. And then a charitable foundation that thought philosophy was important uh, gave us uh, money to produce an online master's on philosophy. Um, so that's our data for the MOOCs. One, a type of MOOC that was invented in Edinburgh that is uh, quite interesting is a real-time MOOC. So we had a MOOC on understanding the UK's election. We had a MOOC on understanding the referendum. And that's very kind, Amrita. And we had a MOOC on understanding the US presidential election. Now, the thing about these MOOCs was to start with, they were just, well, this is the position. You know, Britain is not going to vote to leave the common market. This is the position. This is how American presidents used to be elected in the wild days in the 19th century when quite extraordinary people. You wouldn't believe the sort of people who got to be president in the 19th century of the US. Quite extraordinary. Uh, and then all of a sudden things started happening in all of these, uh, which the political scientists who were the tutors were not expecting. So everybody was online and there was a great excitement. Oh my gosh, look what's happening with Trump. How can this be? Is this true? Um, so these are quite nice. And of course, then they become available as social science. You then have a, a, a record of 30 or 40,000 people around the world tracking events in an election and discussing it. And of course, you can then analyze it and look at it. So we've done, so they've done different sorts. So there have been a pile, a pile of surprises, but one, one surprise uh, for us was this invention of real-time real MOOCs. If we look at the different types of things that go on in e-learning, multiple choice branching is um, very familiar. It's been done since the, automatically since the 1950s. Drill and practice being done since the 1960s. People don't like drill and practice. It's used for mathematical skills. It's used for second language skills, but it works. It, you know, if you really want to drive up your vocabulary in another language or you really want to establish your number bonds, drill and practice does work. Databases and simulations allow you to have access to the past data. Um, one of the areas I've worked in is intelligent tutors. We'll talk a bit more there. But that's where you do a careful machine intelligence analysis of what a learner is doing so that you can predict what their, what their things they do not understand are, and then you make interventions based on that understanding. Games are very effective. A lot of what has happened in e-learning was actually predicted. There was a wonderful article written by Vannevar Bush in the United States who had experience of the British work with computers during the Second World War. And in 1946, he wrote a paper called As We May Think, and he was already in the um, 1940s predicting things like multiple choice branches, branching and databases as something that would surely happen. A thing he didn't predict, which came, and, and which I didn't predict either, which came as a surprise to people, was in the early 1990s, someone called Roxanne Hiltz invented what she called the virtual classroom. That is, you have a classroom where the people are in different locations, but they have a way of communicating with each other. Nowadays, that's not surprising. Uh, it was surprising then, but virtual classrooms, that, that does mean it is very easy to have peer learning. It means it's easy for somebody who is physically disabled to still be part of a classroom. Um, it's, and there is a debate. The, t the view is typically a virtual classroom needs about 25 learners. If you've got 50 in it, it's too big, and you don't learn who they are. If it's got five in it, that's too small, and it's embarrassing. 
So what we do at Edinburgh, which is quite normal for online learning, is you basically break the students up into groups of 25 and put them in different virtual classrooms. There's mixed uh, realities. That's vir virtual realities. And if you've never put one of these headsets on, I would encourage you to try and do that. Um, but you can, do, you can mix that with the real world and you can mix that with different alternate realities and MOOCs. So there's quite a lot of different things. So one thing I have to tell you is, although the MOOCs have had a lot of press, they've been very successful, uh, the MOOCs have not killed any of the other types of e-learning. The drill and practice is still there. Also, the drill and practice is very old. It goes back to the 1960s, really. The multiple choice is still there, but the other things are still there. So the MOOCs are adding. The MOOCs are an extra thing for learners around the, the world. Um, just to talk a, a little bit about the sorts of things uh, we can do now. Um, remote access to laboratories and observatories. So students, as I said, they can, they can stay in bed and watch their physics experiment or... Slightly more interestingly, um, we could all participate. There is one, one of the biggest telescopes in the world is in the Andes Mountains. We can all, we can all um, stay in bed in Mumbai and log on and look at the data uh, for, for what is happening on that thing there. Virtual laboratories, and virtual laboratories are nice things. You can do nu nuclear explosions in a virtual laboratory. Nobody gets hurt. You can, do exp you can make uh, the Earth time run fast and... You know, have uh, one minute represent 100,000 years and watch how the Earth is changing. Um, you can do online field investigations. Um, so nowadays sensors are so cheap uh, and, and your mobile phone has got lots of stuff in it, for example, and you can have these little sensors that wake up that you're, if you're interested, let us say, in what the tiger in the forest is doing or what the animal living underground is doing, well, you just leave a little computing device outside where they're living, and they come out at night usually. The, the, the more, a lot of the interesting animals come out at night, and you have infrared, and boom, you, you have these recorded images of the, of the interesting animal, and you can see, see who the tiger is eating from, you know, from, or, or uh, such. Um, and... This leads me to the point to make about citizen science. There are now um, in a range of websites. The biggest one is amateur astronomy. There are now about a million amateur astronomers in the world. So one of the courses that we did in Edinburgh uh, was to do with, is there, are there aliens? Is there, is, there, is there life in other planets? Is there life in other galaxies? And you know, the sort of thing you do there is you look for things like ammonia, things that, that you know, sig signals of things that could represent that. That um, uh, course w was very successful. Uh, it was so successful that it kept going. And to my, our surprise, after the course finished, we still had two groups of students, one in North Kazakhstan and one in South Kazakhstan, who were sitting in their internet cafes uh, busily hunting for aliens and sending each other emails. But across the world, there are now about a million amateur astronomers. They are subject to quality control. Professional astronomers look at their deductions, get other... And, and typically what happens is an amateur astronomer thinks they've found something, they then pass it to four or five other am amateur astronomers who, are, who may say, no, you're wrong, there isn't anything there. Or this group may all agree, and then a professional astronomer looks at what they're suggesting. If they have found something, then that, that is logged, and they are given a higher reliability rating. Um, if it's all nonsense, it isn't logged, and they're given a lower right reliability rating. So astronomy has suddenly become uh, democratic with open access to the data. Uh, also looking at flora and fauna, a very nice system is called iSpot. It started at the British Open University. The University of Edinburgh has <coughs> now appointed Professor Jonathan Silvertown, who did this, uh, produced this software uh, to a chair in biology and geology with us. And what you do with iSpot is you take a picture of an animal or a plant with a mobile phone. You then take it to a database, and you can then uh, you have various automatic aids. 
and that allows you to determine is this a completely normal uh, butterfly or bird or plant or is it r rare and we had a wonderful example of an eight-year-old girl in Britain who found a moth which was the bi biologists firmly believed that what did not did not exist in Europe it was an Asian moth but there it was in the field in Surrey and this eight-year-old girl identified it using iSpot and, and her mobile phone um, and so this is very nice and it means you can do, for example, surveys of, you know, one of the reasons we are so sure about climate change is that using systems like iSpot, you can ask four or 5,000 people in all parts of Britain, are the bluebells and the daffodils coming out earlier this year than five years ago? If all 5,000 of them say yes, then it's at least a week earlier because I can remember the daffodils came up at my daughter's birthday or whatever. You've got something. So there is iSpot. So everything is surviving. The other question I was interested in was how big is a MOOC? Uh, and a MOOC turns out, if you do it in study hours, it's a, about 100 MOOCs make up is the same size as an undergraduate honours degree, a bit bigger than I thought uh, the MOOC is, that is. Um, if you look at a master's degree, you've got 25 MOOCs. One of the things that happens to MOOCs is to get chopped up. I've called these typical bit is about five minutes of video or access. or uh, And these minnows get used and reused all over the place. And here is where I got very disappointed because I wanted to have enough minnows to make a reasonable size whale. But actually, baby killer whales are pretty small for fish. I was, you know... And it, but I would have needed a million minnows uh, to get to a reasonable size. But that, is, but that is, as it were, the size range uh, of, of the things we're using electronically. We're talking, we're arranging for things that the user will look at for uh, use for about five minutes to things that they will use, study for part time for for about eighty study hours to things that would take a year, twenty five MOOCs. Realistically, shouldn't really do more than. A, than that, that would still involve doing two or three MOOCs in parallel most weeks, uh, to 100 MOOCs. So that's the size. Uh, teacher bots were men mentioned. This is something that we, we have invented um, in Edinburgh. We've got a, a big team who... Uh, we, the problem is you've got now tens of thousands of learners. You haven't got that many teaching assistants. So you want to use artificial intelligence to make electronic teachers in assistance, we've called them teacher bots. What do they do? Well, they automate Twitter responses, they do, do peer assessment, they do semantic analysis of discussion forums, they assign people to different groups, um, they help us with group dynamics. There's quite a literature on teacher bots now. Uh, and the observation to make is that they are successful. We are. Um, some universities have had MOOCs that have crashed. Uh, we were very amused when a university had a MOOC on how to make MOOCs, which crashed and couldn't work. But, no, but none of that, but none she of that was to manage them. And we also have an online master's in how to do digital education. Uh, not, lots of nice things in it. Lots of nice courses on digital futures, on course design. Um, so if you're seriously interested, you, you do not have to leave Mumbai. You can enroll in our online uh, masters in digital education. For me, one of the great values of this uh, work is that we get autonomous learners. Working in these environments, they can identify and refine their own goals, identify their preferred learning partners. It's, it's much less rude to make friends with one person, you know, to stop, you know, as, you know if you're here and we're doing something interactive and you sort of look at your neighbor and then you move to the other side of the room, it's sort of embarrassing. It's extremely easy to move away from your neighbor in a virtual classroom. Nobody really notices that the geometry in a virtual classroom is much simpler. Um, you, you can, uh, the, in the electronic world, they can identify their preferred mentor. They can identify their preferred language, choose the route, route to goals, def define personal success criteria, and be really quite reflective. And one of the nice things about e-learning is you have the chronology. You can always go back over what did you do when. So for me, a very compelling example is in the, uh, the veterinary school, somebody who's learnt, let's say, has learnt <clears throat> about a particular puppy with a sore foot. Then three years later, as part of their teaching, 
three, three years, and they used an antibiotic and it was successful. Three years later, somebody brings a puppy in and they think, oh, that puppy's foot looks similar to the one I saw three years ago. Well, they can just go if they've got the record. You know, we know we don't delete things now. They, they can just travel back three years before and say, oh, let me look at the photos of that puppy. So let me finish with my optimistic conclusion. My optimistic conclusion is that this technology is really helping lifelong learners, helping it be possible for learner, all learners to be researchers. MOOCs are global. It's, it varies, um, obviously. We, as I said, we're not in North Korea. Uh, we have more, much more penetration uh, in India than we have in China, but that's not surprising because of the uh, language issues. Top universities, um, if you look at Harvard and MIT, they're combined in, in edX. You look at Stanford, uh, you look at Berkeley, you look at Edinburgh. We're increasing learner autonomy. We can do the analytics, and you have peer assessment and self-assessment. So you've been very kind to listen to me. I'm stopping now, and I'll just put up a slide which will mention uh, some of the people whose work I was talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Timothy. This was really very interesting. And I think technology has touched every aspect of our life, um, not just how we live, but how we learn. And when e-learning and online uh, learning came into India, we thought that was really the solution for India, because with 50% uh, of India's population under the age of 25, uh, you know, we have currently 124 million in the eligible age for higher education, which is 18 to 23, and only 30% of those are in colleges and schools in, in higher education. So I think the way ahead for India is very much uh, online education and e-learning, but we haven't done so well as yet. And I think the reason is um, it's important just to uh, get a bit of uh, uh, history about how Indian higher education started. We inherited it from the British, and uh, um, it's almost uh, so many years now, and we continue the affiliating system of higher education, which has been done away, I think, in most parts of the world, and uh, there are much more autonomous colleges, but uh, we continue with the affiliating system, and you'd be surprised to know that yesterday, the University of Mumbai, uh, which is a 160-year-old university, had its convocation, and it has over 800 colleges affiliated to it. And uh, we have about, uh, with the 700 universities we have in the country, we have about 36,000 uh, colleges, again, affiliated. So our system of higher education is highly regulated. Our system of higher education... Uh, a bit stifling, I would say, and I would give my own example that in the year 2000, I became the dean of one of the institutions of the University of Mumbai. It was the year of millennial, millennium, and I thought uh, this is the year when we must bring in much more technology into higher education. And uh, uh, I would see that there were 7,000 students in my college with 60 faculty members, and they had assessments going on throughout the year, and, and admissions going on, and everything happening together, and I felt, well, let me get one thing off them, and that is let me try and introduce online examination or, or online testing to some extent. But it took me seven years to introduce that. And in 2007, I introduced online testing because the university said it was not permitted. Well, so we didn't introduce it. Now, coming to what it is today, um, the MOOCs are really the future for India today because we have uh, a huge young population which will need education. But Talking about MOOCs, because we have introduced MOOCs uh, in our universities, but not they are not a part of the regular system. It's not a part of your curriculum, because you have to do one curriculum, which the university or the UGC states. So my first question to you is, how will distance learning or online 
learning um, impact education in our developing countries? How will we take this forward? And, and I think more so, let's talk about the learners. How do I motivate young people to become autonomous learners when it is not a requirement of their mandatory degree? That's our biggest challenge. It, they are going to get the degree only from going into classes, doing the curriculum that the university states. And we felt here was an opportunity where we could introduce MOOCs, which wherever the curriculum was not, not enough, we could have done this through the MOOCs. But it's not happening because we are finding that when we encourage them to do Coursera courses, or we encourage them to do any of these courses, the completion rate is less than 10%. So how do we encourage? How do we, we, we are a very teacher-centric system, and the self-motivation and the self, uh, and the students are not self-directed. How do we make them autonomous learners? It's our biggest challenge, because the system is not going to change if they want to really learn and take advantage of technology, it has to be the MOOCs. But how do I motivate young people that forget what the university is doing, go ahead and learn new things? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, I mean, there, there is a real, real problem when, when the universities are not autonomous. I mean, I, I cannot think of any jurisdiction in the world where the control of civil servants uh, improves the quality of the university. Um, Their the, the judgments typically are based, based on, on notions of safety and based, based on notions of um, historical practice. So that is, that is one issue. It's a, obviously, it's a, it's a profoundly political issue, uh, but university auto, autonomy matters. Um, in terms of motivating the learner, um, the key thing uh, has to be credit. The key thing has to be that the study can be part uh, of an award eventually, uh, which leads to an improvement in career choices. And if you look at what is happening at Coursera, or you where, where they have cre where they give credit, or you look at what what is happening uh, at edX, where they have what they call our micro masters, that the move now with MOOCs is to give uh, credit for each MOOC, for the credit to be accumulated. And for then somebody to say, okay, so now I have a micromasters uh, in uh, this or that subject from MIT or wherever, um, and th that clearly is a is a problem for the student. If the student gets some credit from Edinburgh or Arizona State University or MIT, uh, and the Indian government says, but this is not recognised credit. This is not real credit. That's a problem. On the other hand, there are a lot of jurisdictions in the world that would say, you know, a piece of paper that says MIT on it, and that says you, you know, you can do you know, advanced systems programming. But that's, you know, a, pr a pretty useful piece of paper. But I think that the, for the students, the motivation has to be recognition of the study in, in a in a way. And the whole thing about MOOCs, their size and such, is has to be the notion of the accumulation of credit. Um, some places, I mean, Scotland is an example. Uh, it's true in um, quite a number of the European countries have at the country level a credit accumulation and transfer system. That is to say that there is a way of bringing, so it's, say the University of Edinburgh can say, here are some mathematics courses. These are um, at levels seven and eight and nine. Now a student in, the, in Scotland can take those and take some courses from Glasgow, put them together, and because you can accumulate and transfer credit, then you know, start moving with some Edinburgh credit to, let's say, a Glasgow award, and there might also be some Aberdeen. And that would be a political thing to argue for, but if India ha ha developed a credit accumulation transfer system, um, that would be a good thing. Um, any sort of prejudice that says on online is lower quality uh, for the completed student 
uh, than not uh, just doesn't make sense. If you look at, let's say, the Indira Gandhi National Open University or the, or the British Open University, which was the inspiration for that, or, I mean, if you look at it in Edinburgh, I mean, Scottish surgeons are not no notoriously wild, carefree people. A uh, Scottish surgeon tends to, you know, we are talking very serious, very conservative people, and yet the Scottish surgeons say that the surgeon who learns with us in their own hospital online for two years comes out to a higher standard than the surgeon who comes to Edinburgh for a year to learn in the city. And, and partly, of course, if they come to Edinburgh, they have much less access to clinical situations. Um, but So... So I think you you are stuck with a, a political battle. I mean, I, I, it's clearly uh, makes no sense in the modern world to say credit cannot be acquired by studying online. It really doesn't make much, any, any sense to say that credit can't be accumulated. Um, so I think um, so. It's not very optimistic for us in the universities because the curriculum hasn't changed from last so many years. I don't know how and when they will give credit to MOOCs. But one of the areas where the MOOCs are doing very well are coaching classes. And there is there is an entrepreneur, um, this 35 year old young man, who has started what is called Biju. And the Biju is the most funded, uh, you know, startup today, and has got 125 million uh, funding, uh, which I don't think even educational institutions ever get. But has got this, and has got 5.5 million students who have registered because it's coaching for them to how do how to do well in your class 10 or your high school. And I think even Khan Academy actually started because it made math easier. And math is mandatory. And so therefore, um, so we'll wait. We hopefully uh, do wish that we'll get more autonomy to be bring, able to bring in. Till then, I'm sure if there are some students here, please be self-directed and self-motivated and get on with these MOOCs. One of you can even become a surgeon. That's not that a good thing. Um, let me get back to a second point. Um, you know, technology is not just for the young. Today, it's interesting to see this uh, magazine here, you know, The Economist, and it's the most current economist. And it says, the only way technology more than you helping the young people who are millennials anyway and are up with it. But what about the people who need uh, help, you know, when, uh, for as continuous education? And it's interesting to see how people are uh, employing younger and younger people um, in their uh, offices and so on. Let me just give you an example I've just employed today in our uh, institution. Um, uh, the CI, CIO, which is the Chief Information Officer, and can anyone guess his age? 19 years. And I think, uh, uh, you know, to see this uh, amazing, some of our students double up, and I have some students here who double up uh, in most of these cases when we're not able to get the right people because I think they are so adept. But, what do you feel is is the scope of MOOCs for continuous education? I, I, th I think the scope is enormous, and I think uh, one of the things we will see is uh, more and more older people um, coming on. Um, you know, we're in a situation now where ev everywhere in the world people are li living older. Um, everywhere in the world... Um, the things associated with different types of employment and different types of understanding is changing. So a move to lifelong learning, a move, you know, we see this uh, very, very strongly in the medical world. You know, the people who have been trained with different medical specialities are having to come back to the university every two or three years to be updated. And the easiest way to deliver that is online. You know, if you're working as an accountant, there are new tax rules, there are new ways of doing computations. Um, if you are retired, 
um, you, you know, you may want to study art history or um, gardening or such. So I see, you know, a big a big move into n not, um, continue, continuing education of different sorts. Some of it vocational, uh, some of it uh, for for personal development. And I think we saw that when a lot of people put up their hands and said that have done online courses. Uh, I'm sure here are people who are trying to do continuing education. My dear husband who's sitting over here is doing a Coursera course on uh, Greek. And I said, why are you doing Greek art? And he said, ever since I was in school, they said, you won't understand this because it's Greek and Latin. So I said, let me understand now what's Greek. So you must find out, have you completed it? That's more important, halfway through. All right. Okay, a second uh, important point. I found one particular slide very interesting, and that was MOOCs and minnows. That's very interesting. Um, minnows... Um, uh, so you do think the length of the uh, online program matters because today with the young, uh, you know, yeah, with the younger people and with their attention spans being what it is, they just want those, you know, I actually look at this and I say, it's a YouTube, how many minutes is it? You know, people keep sending you the YouTubes and so on. If it's anything beyond three minutes or anything beyond two minutes, I don't watch it. So. What do you, how did you think about this and was there any research done and what do you feel about the length of uh, online program? Because I think that's a learning for us. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly the case that the attention span goes very, very quickly in, in something like a lecture. Um, and our experience, but it's, it's really quite common if you look at MOOCs, is basically they are built of separate bits that are about five minutes. Maybe five, maybe five minutes of somebody explaining something, five minutes of a video, a test item that takes about five minutes, sometimes a bit longer, and sometimes you know it may not be a test, it may be a, a joint report that people are writing. Uh, but a lot of it um, is, is created from essentially small, high-quality bits of video, um, um, tests that have been evaluated, uh, group work discussion items, um, but it's you know they, it is you know we're, we're very lucky. Quite a number of the people in the audience are still looking at us, um, but you know but if you do eye tracking experiments and you watch people learning in front of a computer or for that matter learning in front of a lecturer, you know, they they very quickly are going going off somewhere else. And so structuring it so that they can go somewhere else and then come back because it's in reasonable size lumps makes very good sense. And I thought um, even another concept which was very interesting was a teacher bot. How would you like a robotic uh, being in the class? And so does the teacher bot get into the class at all? The, the, the teacher bot is an online presence uh, in the online world, um, just uh, like um, uh, uh, the the human tutor who will be online and may, may be in a different country. Uh, but recently in um, an online course in machine learning, in fact, um, the students were just told there were four tutors. Uh, and they worked away, and the tutor, these four tutors gave different bits of advice during this course, took a whole semester. And at the end, the professor said, actually, two of those tutors were computer programs, and the other two weren't. Which was which? And the students could not tell. Because the student does something standard, it, says it involves a frequently asked question, and they get this message saying, no, go back and change that parameter, or, or you should have used a pair of parameters, or you haven't initialized the thing properly. Uh, and, and, and obviously the teacher, and, and you cheat a bit, the teacher bot says, you know, uses your name. You know, hi Ram, good to see you again. Uh, you're going to do the third exercise now, are you? But that, so I, I found that interesting. I mean, I'm obviously much harder for the teacher bot to fool you if it's in an area where, let, let us say, you know, you're learning psychiatry and the teacher bot is talking to you about empathy. But if you're learning, say, a mathematical topic, so, so and the thing about the teacher bots, 
is, is, is really very simple. A lot of people will have the same question at the same point in the study. Um, so you automate the answering of, of that. So you get some FAQs done and then they are able to answer those. Um, well, one of the, uh, you've shown us so many um, interesting new aspects of technology that you introduce at the University of Edinburgh. I think one of them is medical informatics. And uh, I did read that in 2015 you've put a, you set up an institute of medical informatics. Uh, we've started a design school, and I think the design informatics is is interesting. How far and and what are you doing in this area? Um, we, we're being really quite successful uh, in it. Uh, we we have um, advantages in Scotland for in for medical in, informatics. Uh, we have a sort of leadership at the University of Edinburgh in in data science um, and and in statistical analysis. In fact, uh, with, do, does anybody know who Thomas Bayes was? Bayes Law. He's the person who invented the so the statistics that, for example, established the causal relationship between uh, lung cancer and tobacco smoking. But he was actually an, an Edinburgh cha tra Edinburgh University trained clergyman. But the, the advantages we have are. Um, Scotland um, is a relative, is a genetically stable country. Um, there is a very little inward immigration, so there's genetic. It's, it's a bit almost like Iceland. It's genetically very stable. You have many generations of, of families in the cities. It also has, uh, for and this is very nice for pharmaceutical companies, a very obedient population. Uh, which is if the doctor says we would like you to take part uh, as part of your illness to take part in this study um, in Scotland the patient just says yes doctor and they sign up and they, and they do this um, and in Scotland we have unique patient identifiers so, the, uh, so that has meant that we have been able using data analysis particularly to do work on, in epigenetics and particularly to do work on the genetic uh, basis of some conditions. So there are some conditions where there isn't a gene for it, but there is a genetic pattern. And if you know family history, um, and we had a very nice event where uh, we have <clears throat> done work on the genetic basis of schizophrenia, and we have a partnership with the drug company Merck on that. That, that, that has gone very well. <clears throat> and that, you know, to take that example, using the statistics, um, you can, if it's a young man and they show certain symptoms, you can say there is maybe a 50% chance of schizophrenia and therefore they should be given a prophylactic drug. On the other hand, it may be a 60-year-old woman and you may, may then, with equal statistical confidence, say, no, no, it is almost definitely not. Um, the start of schizophrenia. It is almost definitely something else. You need to be looking at dementia or at Alzheimer's or such. Um, so, so it is work that is very is very successful. Um, and essentially, if you've got five million patient records, you can start saying with confidence uh, about things that are linked, uh, which you can't do if you've got you know a thousand records. Um, so it's um, quite important for us. Um, yeah. Um, of all the um, technological, uh, educational technologies that you've introduced, which one excites you the most? Um, I, I, I find that a difficult question, actually. Um, I quite like elaborate simulations. So there is a program called RASMOL. Uh, which allows you to do, and somebody's nodding there, but allows you to look at quite complicated uh, molecules, proteins, and uh, manipulate them in three dimensions. So things that allow you, I mean, I like thinking in, 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 in multiple dimensions. So things that allow you to do visualization of quite complex things, like complicated 3D molecules, and, and then ask the question, well, suppose I flip it this way, could it relate to this molecule in some other way? So I think, I think high-quality visualizations built on models is what would excite me the most. And a final question before I uh, throw it open to the audience is, uh, um, you know, today the world is such 
the world's largest taxi service doesn't own any the world's largest uh, uh, you know the accommodation providers don't own any rooms uh, the the world's largest uh, you know uh, what, what the facebook which reaches millions does not create any content of its own um will we go towards uberization of education if i can uber and call a cab will i uber and get a qualification from the university well it d- depends i mean how seriously you you would take a a, a masters degree from uber um <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean the, the serious point is that you know Mumbai University Delhi University University of Edinburgh have established reputations uh have the ability to award d- degrees and these but these are a certain sort of currency um it's I find it difficult to uh, I mean, there has been a spread of sort of vocational awards uh, with with mozzarella and their badges and such in in some um, technology areas, but I think there will, you know, universities have been going for hundreds of years. I think the desire to say I have got a degree from a well-known institution uh, and I can and I'm not and I can associate myself with the academic in the intellectual community of that institution. That is quite quite a powerful thing. Um, so it would be hard to see how you could build a brand um, that wasn't based on an, an intellectual community uh, where the, uh, people would want to get a degree from. They might want to get other things from it. So, um, you know, and, and just just before again, I uh, ask the audience for questions. Um, it's interesting to see that yesterday at the um, convocation of the Bombay University, we had uh, our vice chancellor who said that now his whole um, entire focus is going to be on digitalization uh, and he's going to bring in reforms and we're looking for that we really hope so and i hope he will get some of this dialogue that we've had and we should send him uh, a copy there but an interesting thing that he's done yesterday is he has introduced what is called a digital locker initiative so what it does is it's one place where you would go to for attestation employment verification process and everything and the first digital locker yesterday was open for mr mukesh ambani who is also an alumni of uh, this with this uh, let's let's open it up to yes why don't you hello uh, this is alpana and my question is about uh, when we are talking about digitization of uh, education how do you see it mapping with the industry its current state and what our universities are doing uh, on this track basically to map it to the industry requirements thank you no that's a very good question i i think if you you know the all industry s- sectors are using information technology more and more there's there isn't one uh where where for which that is not true um so i think it could can be made if the universities work at it and work at their industry links um it can be made to work very well so you know so for say the school of engineering at edinburgh to track the different types of engineering the technologies that are being used and being developed and then to mirror that back i think that's a perfectly good po- possibility and and i think it you the assumption in your question that we should track where industry is going i think i think is exactly right because the other thing that is happening of course is we is within industry with regard to jobs um there is a real there is a squeezed middle so if you are the person who cleans the floor um well even then i put you need steps or something because there are perfectly good robots now that will clean floors that don't have steps but if you're doing some of the physical jobs in a firm you are safe if you are the head of the firm you're probably safe if you're in the middle operating a spreadsheet or an inquiry line uh almost certainly there is a risk uh of in that middle of your job being squeezed out and replaced by some form of automation or some form of robot um so there is quite, there is 
you know, as, and we see industry reconfiguring. You know, one of the great drivers for the surprise in the United States was the way that large chunks of U.S. manufacturing industry had had failed to compete with Asia in, in the, the last couple of decades. Um, so we see industry changing quite fast. Because so much of that change is technologically based, then the universities ought to be able to take advantage of the technology itself. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for a really interesting uh, talk just now. Incidentally, the only reason I know of Bayes is because of a brilliant YouTube video I watched last week on how the human mind is not like a Bayesian net. So, yeah. Uh, so my question has more to do with what you see the scope for uh, digital education in the space of vocational training. Um, the organization I work with works with a lot of industrial training institutes, a lot of these vocational training institutes, and what do you think the scope for this technology is in that space, especially keeping in mind the industry requirements, keeping in mind that there are a lot of jobs that are to be lost uh, probably in the future. Thank you. Um, I, I think with regard to vocational training, uh, there, is, there is tremendous scope, particularly because so many skills now are exercised using technology. Um, you can take the, the, the technology that is being used in the workplace and just turn it into a teaching system. Um, so like my surgery example, you know, is we, you take, you take a version of the electronic device that, that a real surgeon uses to make a real operation and you turn it into a teaching device. Anything that has got a technological base then can be, you know, easily turned into some sort of teaching aid. Um, thanks, Satim, for a great uh, speech. Um, we live in an era in which expert seems to have become a rather derogatory term. Experts have been dismissed in the EU referendum in the uh, US election, and we, live in a, we hear a lot about a post-truth era. Is this in part a function of the democratization of education that you've described? Does open access devalue knowledge? Interesting. Well, that, that's um, um, it, that's a very interesting question. Now, I, I, my, my straight answer would be no, um, but obviously I should, should elaborate on that a little bit. Um, certainly something has um, strange has been happening in, in the political arena uh, where it is possible for politicians to essentially uh, you know, point to professors and journalists and say, well, you shouldn't believe them because they spend all their time learning about this stuff. Um, and that, that, that seems to be odd. No, I, I don't, so I don't, but I don't think this has come about as, as a result of the democratization. I think in the long run, quite the reverse. I think as we see things like citizen science, um, and for that matter, there's no reason why we shouldn't be seeing citizens, citizen medicine. You know, as, as stuff becomes more and more um, available electronically and it can be mediated and, and, and monitored, I, I would see that as a, as a movement that would empower people um, to become experts and think of themselves as experts. So, um, so my view is there has certainly been an unfortunate social tendency which was terribly encapsulated by that remark about experts, uh, but that the sorts of things I'm talking about give you a push in the other direction. May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I had two questions. Firstly, what is the business model that you have for these MOOCs? Because I heard you say that there was a, a charitable foundation that gave money for that course on philosophy. That was my first question. And the second question, which I think I'm much more intrigued by, is you've been in, uh, you did your PhD or your doctorate in machine learning 50 years ago, you said. And what did you think, where did you think machine learning was going to go 50 years ago? And now, where do you think machine learning is going to go 50 years from now? <laughs> I, I mean, you just have to answer that. <laughs> uh, those are two, two, two very different questions. Um, on, on the first question, um, the, and I, you'll probably tell me off for this, we didn't, when we started with the MOOCs, we didn't really have a business model. We thought they wouldn't cost very much and be interesting. So we did six. Um, two in science and engineering, two in medicine, and two in arts and the humanities. Uh, then when we got 
then that where they were working, we liked them. Uh, we found the philosophy one started generating money. Um, the um, one on uh, looking for um, space aliens started generating reputation. Um, it's, so for some of the topics where we have had a successful MOOC, uh, we, so we did a MOOC on artificial intelligence planning, for example, um, and we did, as I said earlier, a book for astrobiology. If you type artificial intelligence planning or astrobiology uh, into Google, the University of Edinburgh comes top, comes above everybody. This is very unfair uh, because the Americans have, have got more elaborate astrobiology in, in Washington than we have in Edinburgh, and Stanford has got more elaborate artificial intelligence planning uh, in California than we have in Edinburgh, but we've got the MOOCs. So, we have, so MOOCs have been reputation builders, um, they've added to our audience, and some of the MOOCs have an intimate relationship with an online masters. Um, but the other observation is the MOOCs have not been expensive. The, 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 co the additional cost of the MOOC to us has been about one US dollar uh, per MOOC learner. So that's so so two million US dollars for an institution uh, whose annual budget is 150 million US dollars, and that two million incurred over three years. This is this is not a scary number, you know, for some something that is exciting and reputation building. But we have been we have but we have been getting some income from from it. The other question, where, where did I think machine learning was going to go? Oh, my God, I have to imagine, imagine myself very much uh, younger. Um, I thought machine learning would be applied in a whole range of artificial intelligence set settings. Um, I didn't get it right. The place where you probably are... You pro have any of you noticed that your mobile phone or your sat-nav gets better at understanding you? Yeah. Now, you may think it's because you've learned how to talk to it, but that's wrong. It's actually, it's learned how to uh, understand you. So a place where machine learning, my area of machine learning is used a lot, is pay, people have different ways of using saying syllable and S. They have different ways of pausing. And if you talk to a, device, a speech recognition device, like a sat nav or Siri, it learns about how you speak. So I didn't predict that. It's, it's quite nice that it's happened. Um, I thought that um, a, a world chess champion, a robot would be a world chess champion probably about now, and I was quite wrong about that because that happened about 15 years ago. Um, so that says it's going a bit faster. And the thing that really surprised me is a firm called DeepMind, which has subsequently been bought by Google. Um, they produced um, a world champion for the game of Go. Now, if you know about chess, chess is quite complicated, but it's only got 64 squares, and it's not got that many moves. Go, a Go board has 391 points on it. Uh, you enclose space. Um, and the way they did this was they had these uh, machine learning algorithms, a bit like the Bayes net that was mentioned earlier. And they got these computer programs that play Go to keep playing each other playing thousands of games against each other so that they kept learning how, how they lost. And then they put all that together, got the world Go champion, who was a Korean. The computer won the first three games. The Korean, the Korean won the fourth game, and people thought, oh my gosh, now he's learned how to beat it. But it was exactly wrong. The machine learned how to beat him, and it won the fifth game. Um, so, so I think I'm surprised. I mean, I know the complexity of Go is such you could not do it by exhaustive search. You know, you, you're talking about number 391 times 390 times 389. The number of possible moves is so large that no computer in the world, no matter how powerful, even if you ran it for a week, could do an exhaustive search. The way the Go program gets good is the way a human gets good. It learns the different shapes, the different patterns, the different moves. So I guess I'm surprised um, by, by, by it now. 
So yeah, I guess it went a bit slower than I expected, you know, 40 years ago. It's now going a bit faster than I would be, would be expecting. Yeah. Hey, let's take two questions. Okay. Two uh, questions. okay. Ma'am, so I have a couple of questions for you. So, yeah. So, because I got interested when you talked about digitization of education in India, okay. So, if you look at the Indian education system, there are multiple stakeholders in any college. So, if digitization happens, how would teachers react to it? Because most of the teachers may not be so technologically advanced to actually curate a digital classroom. That's my first question. And the second question is that, uh, if we go about doing a digitization, then there would definitely be increased costs in the first few years. That can't be done away with. So, how do you think the parents and the management would react if you tell them to shell out more money for this thing? Because in India, education is essentially a cost problem, not a quality problem. Correct. Um, so, I'm also, I, I think we have similar problems and I'll ask you also to answer this. But your first point was on how would teachers react. There is initial always resistance and I'm sure you also face that. And uh, also, it's, it's not just resistance, but it's the uh, capacity. They have not been able to build this capacity to, to move with the times uh, because it's face-to-face -face teaching and it, it's very difficult in that. Uh, but I have to say that, you know, there are some of us who've done some brilliant experiments with, with this because we wanted to, uh, you know, beat the curve. So, you know, at one stage I remember that all my teachers would tell, and this not just school, but in college, and even till today they do that. They tell them, please leave your telephone, uh, leave your cell phones outside, or we don't want any cell phones in the classroom. And we said that you know that's technology. Let's once take a lecture with the cell phones. And I'm a professor of strategy, and I teach management, and I taught economics through the through the their iPhones because I asked them to Google everything. And when they were googling everything. They were understanding much more. And by the time they were leaving, I did economics and I did Keynesian economics. By the time I finished my 45 or 50 minutes of lectures, people were coming up to tell me that we need to go to the RBI, which is our Reserve Bank of India, and tell them that I don't think some of the policies they've done is correct. Because if you were to really look at the Keynesian economics, this is how it was working and so on. So the, the students started thinking much more than they were if they they were in a, in a classroom where the teacher is only teaching. And, and, you know, there is very little interaction in our schools and colleges because of our numbers. We are overwhelmed with numbers. We have 120, 180 students in a class. And uh, the student-teacher ratio is high. But then we are a 1.3 billion country. And we still are doing well. And I think most of the American and some of the British universities and colleges are run by Indians. And so obviously something is still right about our education system. Uh, the, the, sec the, the second point that you made was um, money. the money. Um, I think Schools, yes, you'll have to ask them for more fees and that would be difficult. But let me tell you, in the universities, we are getting major grants from the UGC. And right now, uh, the Niti Aayog, which is the, the um, uh, you know, Central Planning Commission, has just announced uh, uh, an award of one crore to set up uh, digital and technological advancements in your own colleges. So which is la large and we, HR College just received that because that was the College for Potential Excellence. So we are getting grants and the government is looking at that. But what the government is not doing is giving it credit. So we cannot really introduce it in the right way as we want to. Anything to that? I mean, I make two short observations. I mean, you, you, you have two assumptions, and I disagree with one, and I, and I agree with the other. I mean, I think the conservatism of regular teachers to technology is, in, in my experience, generally exaggerated. Um, they need a bit of time. They often need a bit of privacy. They don't want to be learning the technology in front of their students. Uh, but I've seen a lot of very enthusiastic older professors um, so I disagree with that assumption. The assumption I agree with is, is money. Um, educational change of any time, of any type, takes uh, time and money. 
I, I think you know, there is no way of finessing that. If you want to make the move into digital education, it is going to take a bit of time, and it will definitely cost you additional money, which you have to get from somewhere. It, it doesn't come free. We have two questions. One question there. The gentleman's been putting up his hand. And then we'll finally give you the question. Very good evening, sir. Thank you for a fascinating insight into online learning. Uh, I see one point which is missing in all this discussion is standardization. Like in every other field in engineering, we have standards, global standards, and then there's a convergence. So is there a possibility of uh, accreditation of MOOCs? And is there a move towards some universally accepted standards? which could solve the problem of acceptance? Um, so certainly people have been trying in, in different settings to get standardization. Um, it's um, being d done in sort of in local groups. Some of the European universities are trying to standardize. If you look at the big US platforms like um, Coursera or uh, edX, again, within there, there are attempts to standardize. So the, the intermediate move would be, which is happening for 10 or 12 universities to say, well, we are standardizing how we are offering this mathematics and we are facilitating credit transfer. I mean, it is, I mean, you're quite right. That is, there are a lot of subject areas, and you know, mathematics would be an easy example, where it is possible to have a uniform approach. How do you manage the great time loss in a virtual classroom? How do you manage? Virtual classroom, the time zone, various time zones. Time zone and a virtual Like five persons are very small. Yeah. You want 25 persons yeah. across the world except North Korea maybe. But then they are time zones, you know, different time zones. How do you manage that virtual class? Uh, we 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 have enough uh, MOOC learners that we can put people in. You're, the time, you do have to you do have to know the time zones, obviously, uh, but we can put people um, in the in near enough to each other. I mean, if you, you think a successful MOOC will might have twenty five thirty five thousand students, uh, and the world has twenty four time zones, you're, you're pretty safe. Good. I think um, with this, we'll wind up and uh, just want to thank you, um, Sir Timothy. It's been a brilliant session today. And uh, uh, we do hope she talked about 50 years ahead. What do you see? I do hope see, to see change in India with the digitization. Because as of now, uh, it's, I think, very slow. We haven't really inculcated it into our university system the way we saw it happening here. Uh, it's taking a long time. Our digital uh, education so far is just showing a video in a classroom or discussing it through that. There's nothing much more than that happening as yet. And, uh, uh, you know, even our young startups who are getting into ed tech and, and we're looking at them, uh, a lot of them are struggling because it's not still mainstream. Unless digitization comes mainstream and is accepted by the universities and the entire political system, as you said, we are not going to be able to move ahead very quickly. We could have done wonders because we need to use, uh, you know, online learning and MOOCs because Look, look at us today. We are a 1.3 billion country. We have 124 uh, million people just between 18 and 23. And about uh, almost 60% of India under the age of 30, all of them need education. We don't have enough number of universities, number of schools. The only way we could have rapidly uh, addressed this is had we really embraced digitization and the government policies that supported that. But we're hopeful. Uh, in India, you know, as they say, um, if if things don't if if things don't come to an end, no, if if things don't work out, then probably it's not the end, and then we keep working on that. So with this, a big thank you very much for you. Thank you.